ಓಂ ಅಸತೋ ಸದ್ಗಮಯ ತಮಸೋ ಮ್ಯೋತಿರ್ಗಮಯ ಮೃತ್ಯೋರ್ಮ ಅಮೃತ ಗಮಯ ಓಂ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 ಓಂ ಲೀಡ್ ಅಸ್ ಫ್ರಮ್ ದಿ ಅನ್ರಿಯಲ್ ಟು ದ ರಿಯಲ್ lead us from darkness unto light lead us from death to immortality om peace 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 good morning morning and happy easter to everybody on this uh, very special very auspicious occasion we shall spend this morning talking about and meditating on contemplating on the life of one of the most extraordinary persons who ever lived jesus christ the influence uh, the impact of jesus it's really staggering when you contemplate it definitely in the field of religion but in every field especially in western civilization in western civilization definitely there is no other person who has this kind of impact nobody even comes close i was in the uh, metropolitan museum of art um a couple of times in the last few weeks and uh, one thing i you know when you go there and if you see the exhibition on european art one thing you notice is that from ancient times right after the greek and uh, the early roman period from the christian era onwards how the whole thing paintings and sculpture everything is dominated by one story the story of jesus christ so the tremendous impact you can see there everything is about or related to or inspired by christ the the artwork there until the very recent times until the 19th century or so religion philosophy theology even politics in europe all of it was centered around uh, this one person and and his teachings his followers those who belong to the christian faith that's the largest uh, religion on on earth today the maximum number of followers uh, all over the world a calendar we follow all over the world that starts with the birth of the, with with Jesus Christ that is uh, marking the life of Jesus Christ before and after so this is the extraordinary person we're going to talk about uh, meditate upon this morning and you know one interesting thing is um when you compare how long he taught his actual <laughs> spiritual ministry the years he taught um, what you might say career how long did he work buddha taught for 45 years after his enlightenment till his maha nirvana he taught for 45 years moses taught for 40 years the prophet muhammad taught for 25 years vivekananda that way was less swami vivekananda he for about 10 years i think you know how long jesus christ taught nobody thinks about it if you study carefully you will notice one year if you look at the gospels the original sources um mark matthew luke one year if you consider the gospel of john then it's just less than 3 years in any case not more than 3 years just in that period of time the impact he had not even in the center of the world at that time the center of the world was the roman empire in in um, rome in the outskirts of the roman empire in the middle east which was unimportant at that time so there you see this this started this person lived and taught for just a brief period of time before disappearing from um our vision in fact we are still feeling to from person a human to god to divinity easter marks this transformation the crucifixion friday 
and the resurrection sunday so this is the transformation one interesting insight i had while studying for this um, for today's talk you know there are two images of jesus christ there is the popular understanding of jesus christ and there is a scholarly understanding of jesus christ and there is a problem this problem came only in the last 100 years or so it was not there earlier 19th century 20th century this problem has, uh, has come up what is this problem most people are not aware of it but i'll talk a little bit about it before we get into our main subject and then very interesting insight you get into this problem and solution also you get from the by considering the life of say sri ramakrishna for example what is the problem the popular image the idea of jesus christ that we have is that jesus is the son of god because jesus clearly said so i and my father are one jesus is referred to in the bible as the word made flesh what does it mean this is something that we we also must consider um in hinduism there are the revealed scriptures that the vedas are given we hear about it the vedas were given by god to humanity through the rishis the rishis discovered these spiritual truths and gave it out as the vedas that forms the foundation of the of the hindu faith the vedas at the same time there are incarnations god incarnates in the form of rama or krishna um, or we have chaitanya or ramakrishna or many many incarnations so god comes gives the spiritual truth in the form of scriptures to humanity we have the revealed scriptures the vedas and also god comes in the human form or in other forms also in hinduism multiple times to teach so both incarnation and revealed scripture are there word and incarnation the word and incarnation but in the middle eastern religions the situation is different the revelation of god in judaism and in islam is in the form of the scripture so the scripture was revealed to moses by god the scripture was revealed to prophet muhammad by god so what is the revelation or manifestation of god if you ask a muslim or a, or a jewish person they will say it is the revelation the revealed scripture but if you ask a christian they will say the christian says that it is jesus Jesus is the word made flesh you see the meaning of the other term then so the revelation of god is is uh, jesus the teaching teachings that we find are the teachings given by jesus but the direct manifestation of god is jesus himself so jesus is called the son of god <coughs> jesus is, uh, jesus himself says i and my father are one he says i am the bread of life i am the light i am the way so this is the the understanding that we have of jesus christ not only spiritual teacher not only prophet but the son of god avatar incarnation which hindu <coughs> hindus understand hindus understand both that the revealed scripture and the incarnation but in the middle eastern religions there is this tension that um, uh, that's why jews and muslims will not accept jesus christ as an incarnation of god <coughs> they will accept jesus christ as a prophet maybe as jews will accept jesus christ as a great teacher and uh, the muslims accept jesus christ as a prophet but not as an incarnation of god but the general idea that we have and christians have also about jesus is that jesus is the incarnation of god now what happened what the problem arose in the last 100 years or so what happened was there was a lot of biblical scholarship in europe and they studied the bible in depth using modern techniques of textual analysis you know what they do they will look at the text and see look for similarities and dissimilarities and then on the basis of that they will conclude this is original this came later and so and so forth the scholars that's the job university grant fellowship <laughs> you can publish a thesis but the problem that arose you know they noticed something very interesting all the texts which say jesus is an incarnation of god they all come almost all of them they come from one gospel gospel of john and that gospel 
comes much later. It was not written during or just after the time of Jesus. There's a lot of difference between the Gospel of John and the first three Gospels, which are called the Synoptic Gospels. That means Mark, Luke, Matthew. Those three Gospels, Synoptic means seen together. In those Gospels, Jesus comes as a teacher, as a great spiritual master. And there are hints. I think Mark calls it the messianic secret. So there are hints that there is, uh, that Jesus is divine, but not openly. Jesus himself does not say openly that I am the son of God. I am the son of God. I and my father are one. The word made flesh. All of these things which point to the incarnation that Jesus is an avatar. They come only in the gospel of John. And according to modern scholars, that gospel of John was written long after Jesus passed away. And the modern scholars conclude that Jesus did not say those things. It is only after the church was formed, how the church looked at Jesus as the divinity. That is put in the Gospel of John and it has been, the implication is somehow it has been put in the mouth of Jesus. That is, I did not actually say it. Now this creates a problem. The suggestion seems to be that Jesus did not confirm that I am the son of God. And, but majority of people believe that Jesus is the son of God. So can you see that creates a tension? See, a preacher, a Christian preacher who stands up to preach, now what, it puts him, in a, in, uh, him or her in, in a tight spot. What will he say? That now we are going to talk about the incarnation of God, the Son of God, which is of course not correct, but anyway I will talk about it. <laughs> Nobody ever says that. <laughs> How can you even, even talk like that? But then it creates a tension. Now, if you look at it from the point of view of the life of Sri Ramakrishna, immediately you get the solution. What is the solution? It was really, it struck me when I was studying this. You see, the advantage you have in the life of Sri Ramakrishna is that it's very well documented. It's just very recently, 150 years ago, a lot of people saw Sri Ramakrishna, they left multiple independent accounts of it, which you can compare. There is a photograph, there, there are photographs, multiple photographs, multiple mul accounts from diverse sources. So there is no doubt about the source, that it is during Sri Ramakrishna's time or just after that. And so they actually saw all of this. Now if you look at Sri Ramakrishna's life, you find both kinds of statements. There is no doubt that Sri Ramakrishna said number of times, he who was Rama, he who was Krishna, is in this body, Ramakrishna. That he confirmed that he is the incarnation of God, his avatarhood, Without any doubt, he confirmed it um, more than once. Swami Abhedananda, who was here uh, in, the, in the Vedanta Society of New York, his speech is the only one which is, there's an authentic recording available. In All India Radio in 1936, on the centenary of Sri Ramakrishna's birth, he gave a talk and that is available. No thanks to us, thanks to All India Radio only. That is available and you can actually, nowadays it's on YouTube, you can hear the original talk. It's in Bengali. And he says, how many times we have heard from him, he who was Rama, he who was Krishna is in this body, Ramakrishna. Kotobara He says like that. And we know he told Vivekananda also. On the other hand, he also denied it. Many times, if other people tried to say, you are an avatar of God, he immediately said, don't speak like that. I am, he said, dasher dash. I am the dust of the feet of the servants of the servants of the Lord. I am nothing. I don't like this. So if anybody else tried to put it on him that you are avatar and will bow down to you, no, he did not like it. So what is the mystery? How can you say that I am an avatar and at the same time say, no, no, I am just a devotee. I am not an avatar. How is it possible? It's possible. Because the, the key is this. Sri Ramakrishna said more than once, there are two here. Mother, Ma, the Divine Mother is here and the child is also here. So the avatar, if you think about it, the solution is very simple. It's logical. After all, what is avatar? What is incarnation? Is it human being or God? Or both? Both. So God comes as a human being and is fully God, fully divine and yet the human role is not just play acting. 
It's also sincere. It's also genuine. So an avatar might feel at one time, I'm a devotee. I'm the child and the Lord is my, like Sri Ramakrishna would say, mother, ma. Jesus would say father. If you see the original word he used, Abba. Now even in India also now, it's, you know, often in Muslim families, for example, children will call their fathers Abba. The same word, it's a very endearing word for father, a loving word for father. So it's almost, I was thinking, I was reminded of Sri Ramakrishna saying Ma, mother. So at one point the incarnation might, will genuinely feel, I am seeking God, I am a devotee, I am a child of God, God is the father or mother. At other times, in a divine mood, will feel one with God and realize or talk as, as the divinity. And those who heard Jesus speak, they said he spoke as if with authority, not as the scribes do, with divine authority. So both are possible. In fact, in Sri Ramakrishna's life, numerous times we see, he speaks and he denies that, don't call me avatar, I don't like it. And at other times, in, in, in a divine mood, he clearly speaks as an avatar. This is exactly what must have happened in Jesus' time. There is no doubt that Jesus would have said that, uh, who would have uh, behaved like a devotee as a seeker of God. And also no doubt that in some cases Jesus must have clearly said, I and my father are one. I am the son of God. I am the way, I am the light, I am the bread, uh, I am the bread of life. Uh, this, this is... Uh, some, something that he revealed perhaps to his closest disciples, just like Sri Ramakrishna revealed it to his inner circle. It's almost uh, uncanny, the similarity. Now we can reconcile the two views. Where these scholars go wrong is, they think it must be either this or that. But both are possible. It's quite clear that Jesus must have said also to some people at least, that I am the son of God. Uh, expressing his divinity, his oneness with God. And that must have remained as a secret with a few people. And the scholars are right. It's quite possible the Gospel of John was written a little later, many years after Jesus, when the early church was being formed. By that time, the divinity, that message that Jesus was divinity, the Easter transformation. After Easter, nobody had any doubt. The resurrected Christ is divinity. So that became prominent. Do you see what I'm, where I'm leading? So, the scholars are right. In, by John's time, it had become prominent. By the time the Gospel was uh, written, it had become prominent that Jesus is the Son of God. So, that part is right, no doubt about it. Nobody is doubting the scholarship. But that mistake they have, as ordinary human beings, we think is contradictory to say, I am this, um, I'm, like I'm an ordinary person or a, just a spiritual teacher and I am the Son of God. Both, how can you say? Both can be said. In the case of Avatar, in fact, both must be said. For the common masses, during the lifetime of the Avatara, he would not openly expose that he is an Avatar, only to his closest uh, disciples. Sri Ramakrishna said that when you see the people are openly declaring that I am an Avatar, you will know that my time is at an end. This is the end of my play then. So he used to say that. So what is the resolution of this problem? The, the resolution is this, that Jesus said both during his lifetime, it was not, it probably it was a secret known only to his close disciples. After his lifetime, as it is reflected in the Gospel of John, the divinity of Jesus became prominent. So there is no need to feel this tension that, oh, oh we believe Jesus is the incarnation of God and uh, scholars are doubting it. So maybe we are wrong. You're not wrong. You're quite correct. Jesus is the incarnation of God. And this could be the solution to it. Anyway, I have to check with some Christian theologian whether this idea anybody else has got. Um, many similarities we find. That uh, uh, you, you find that Jesus, how John the Baptist, who used to initiate people. In Sanskrit, we would say Diksha. So John the Baptist would initiate people by dunking them in the waters of the river Jordan. And so the, the baptism uh, ritual which has become part of uh, Christianity after that always, uh, where you sometimes you are actually fully dunked underneath uh, in different 
churches have different kinds of rituals. I remember visiting the great cathedral in Los Angeles, the new one. So that's the head of the Catholic mission in, in uh, uh, Los Angeles, in California, in fact. And uh, it's a vast, very big new cathedral. And Father Alexi, who was giving me and, and others, there was an interfaith group, they were giving us the tour of the new cathedral. So where the baptism is done, there's a pool and there's water, it's quite big. And you can go and easily get dunked in it. He told us a funny story. He was telling us that, uh, you know, LA is prone to earthquakes. So the whole new cathedral has been built in such a way that the whole thing, it's a huge structure. It stands on enormous rubber pillars. So that if there's an earthquake, it will move a little and it, the building itself will not be damaged. So it will just absorb the earthquake by movement. And somebody asked that uh, whether it has been tested and he laughed and he said, no, it has not been tested. But once it happened and told us a very funny story where the baptism goes on, uh, he, we were standing there. He told us once it happened that he said he was taking an interfaith group for a tour. And they were standing at that spot where the baptism and fount was there and the water was there. And at that time there was a minor earthquake. And you know when there's an earthquake, the earth shakes. What shakes more? Water. Water will, will um, sort of spill out or splash out of... I actually saw this when the, uh, the great tsunami came to India. Uh, at that time I was in Belur, standing near a pool or lake actually, not lake, Pukur, we call it a pond. And suddenly I saw the water splashing out in Bengal. Such a, such a long distance. So the water moves more, sloshes. And so this group of interfaith people were standing there and suddenly they didn't feel the church move too much, the cathedral move too much. But the water splashed out, the baptismal water. And it, it, it drenched the rabbi who was standing there. <laughs> <laughs> and the rabbi looked at at Father Alexi and said, he's very humorous, he said, oh, you will do anything to get me baptized, no? <laughs> Even earthquake. <laughs> so, John the Baptist, Jesus himself went to get baptized by John the Baptist. John the Baptist was uh, before, just before Jesus. So, this is a sign of Avatara. The Avatara never comes to destroy. Avatar incarnation comes to fulfill. Whatever has been said and taught in the religion before the Avatar incarnation, that in its purest form, the best teachings, the Avatar comes to confirm that. In the Gita we find that uh, Sarva Dharma Stap, uh, this uh, um, uh, Dharma Stap Sangstapana, to establish religion. Why does an incarnation come? Um, to establish religion means when people doubt religion, whether it's true or not, when people question what is real here, then the incarnation comes to show by his own example that religion is real. And that's why when we chant the Pranam Mantra of Sri Ramakrishna, Sthapakaya Cha Dharmasya, is the establisher of religion. Wasn't religion there before Sri Ramakrishna? Of course. Wasn't religion there before Jesus? Of course. But the incarnation comes and uh, proves to humanity the truth of religion, that it is real and the essential part of religion, the core of religion. Often, sometimes you find teachers coming, spiritual teachers, today especially in the new age and all the people will come and say, oh, I have realized, I have become enlightened and all of this is a unique teaching. I am teaching you something which is not there in the scriptures. Uh, in India, some person came to a Swami in the Himalayas and said, Swami, my Guru has taught me something completely unique. It is not there in your Vedas and Upanishads and Gita. Uh, my Guru has taught something completely new. And then the Swami said to this person, Kahe apne guru ko gali deta hai? Why are you abusing your Guru? It's not a credit. It's an insult to the Guru to say that he is teaching something absolutely new which he has thought of himself, so, which is basically then worthless. So, new path for the, the incarnation of God re-establishes religion in its pure form. So can there be nothing new in religion? Yes, there can be. There can be something new in religion, but that's not so, not so fast, not so cheap, not so easy. 
It comes only once in a great while, and it's usually the incarnations of God, avatars, who can open new paths in religion. Not everybody, and it's not necessary for everybody to, because you know this is the age of creativity in America, especially innovation. Everybody likes something new, the latest idea. Well, in India, if you say latest idea, absolutely new in spirituality, nobody cares for you. They look at you with great suspicion. So Jesus came fulfill to fulfill what has already been said in the the Hebrew scriptures, the the Jewish scriptures before him. In fact, that's how he was received as the Messiah, as the promised one. When he was uh, baptized by John the Baptist, John, in fact, um, looked at him and recognized him. Sufficiently advanced spiritual practitioners, they can recognize an incarnation. They know this is not an ordinary saint. He's not an ordinary man, no doubt. Not an ordinary saint also. It's something beyond that. And uh, he said to Jesus that I should not baptize you. You should baptize me. He had already told people that I am baptizing you with water. The one who will come after me will baptize you with fire. He said that the one who is coming after me, I, am, I will not be fit to tie his shoelaces also. Such a great one is coming. What he meant was not an ordinary saint, an incarnation. So, when uh, Jesus came, um, John said to, John baptized him, and then Jesus had this incredible vision. The way it is described, very tersely. The heavens opened up and the Spirit of the Lord descended as a dove upon him. You are my son in whom I am well pleased. That is the way it is put in the Bible. So often the language is so um, different from the way we, we would, even the English translations, uh, which is so different from the way we speak English, it requires interpretation. But th this again reveals that Jesus is not an ordinary teacher, or ordinary prophet also. That you are my son in whom I am well pleased. So that was the beginning of his spiritual teaching. Short period. But right after that, he went for, he disappeared for 45 days in the wilderness. Uh, intense spiritual practice and prayer. There we have a description of how Satan, the forces of evil, came before him, took him to a high place and showed him the kingdoms of men. All of this will be yours if you give up the spiritual path. You remember Nachiketa and Yama? The story of the little boy who went to the palace, uh, to the king of death, the lord of death, and how he was tempted. Almost the same language, the Lord of Death says to Nachiketa, Here are the kingdoms of men, all of this will be yours. And heavenly pleasures also, which ordinary human beings cannot enjoy, all of this will be yours. Don't ask about spiritual life. But Jesus rejected all of that. So you see that same thing happening in the life of Buddha also, how he was tempted by Mara. Throughout Jesus' life, this is not stressed so much, but in the, in the Gospels itself it is there. How he would retreat for long periods of prayer. There, are, there is a mention in the Gospel itself, whole night spent in prayer. You know, sometimes people say that the picture which you have here, this is an Indianized picture. Like Jesus would have never sat like this in, in a yogic posture for meditation. But not true. Remember, the later paintings that you see, chairs and tables, but Jesus, if, if you see in the Middle Eastern time at that time, 2000 years ago, most of them would have sat, sat on the floor. They would be sitting on the floor mostly. And not on chairs and tables. Not only that, the prayer which they practiced at that time is closer to actually meditation, what we call dhyana today. It's not just two minutes of prayer or five minutes of prayer, whole night, day after day, retreating from the world. So just like you find sadhana in the life of Sri Ramakrishna, there are enough hints in the original Gospels to show the sadhana of Jesus Christ also. And the teaching, when he went, tremendous power. Sri Ramakrishna says, that just by giving lectures you cannot teach spirituality. He would ask, have you been commissioned by God? In Bengali he would use the word chaprash. Have you, been, have you got the stamp of authority? Most people didn't understand. What you mean is you study religion and um, um, here maybe you can get a doctor of divinity and go out and preach. 
But no. Um, uh, authority from the divine authority. Are you a preacher by divine authority? Are you inspired by God? Then only it creates an impact upon the minds of the listeners. Otherwise, fine words. A nice time. You spend nice time listening to a very nice sermon. Or sometimes boring sermon. I remember there's so many funny stories about long sermons, boring sermons. There was um, this preacher who gave a rather long and dull sermon. And afterwards he was greeting the congregation as they left the church. And one gentleman, he saw that the preacher had a bandage here. And he asked him, Father, what happened? He said, oh, nothing. In the morning I was shaving and I was um, thinking about the sermon. I was uh, thinking about the sermon and I cut myself by, just by mistake. The gentleman said, well, Father, next time you think about the shaving and cut the sermon. <laughs> Spoke as if with authority. Even in this, 2000 years ago, the Bible written, whatever little clue we get, how masses of people followed him around. There was some kind of, like bees attracted to honey, and the, the, the flowers, people would come and follow him around. He would have to run away to avoid the crowds. That, that's also mentioned in the, in, in the Gospels. So many people would come. Where is this divine attraction coming from? And the teachings... Sublime teachings, especially the ones he gave, what we call the Sermon on the Mount, most sublime teachings. I'll, I'll share a few. He called some of his disciples. He didn't tell, call everybody. His direct disciples and he shared the best of his teaching with them. You find the Beatitudes in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, for example, blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now again, the biblical language, poor in spirit means what? It means humble. Those who have pride of learning, I have a degree. Uh, those who have pride in riches, money. Pride in youth or strength or power or political connections or whatever. Even pride in um, some preconceived spiritual idea. There is this interesting story of how... Um, the student went to a Zen teacher and asked for a teaching. And whatever the teacher said, the student said, Yeah, yeah, I've read this. It's in that book. It's in this book. I've read that. Uh, this book and that book. And then the teacher sighed and said, All right, have a cup of tea. And Japanese tea ceremony. So the teacher started pouring tea and kept on pouring till the cup overflowed. And the, and the student said, Stop, stop. The cup is overflowing. And the teacher said, Exactly. Unless you empty your cup, how will you taste my tea? <laughs> so that humility, blessed are the poor in spirit. There's a story which Sri Ramakrishna used to tell about a man who went to an ashram and asked, what goes on here? And they said, there's a guru and there are the disciples. Uh, what do the disciples have to do? Oh, a lot of work. You have to get up early in the morning and pray and clean the shrine and to cut wood. You have to fetch the water and a lot of hard work throughout the day. Plus, of course, you have to study and all of this. Oh, I see. What does the guru have to do? Nothing much. Once in a while he gives a talk. And the disciples said, good, I'll become a guru then. That's the, the, the person who said. That, that seems much easier. Blessed are the poor in spirit. For, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. So that humility is, is important uh, to enter into spiritual life. Jesus said to them, Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. What do you mean mourn? Do you have to be sad and do you have to cry? It means, do you hanker for God? Do you cry for God? Do you shed tears for God? Sri Ramakrishna used to say, people shed pot full of tears for uh, children or for money, for everything in the world, who sheds any tears for God? I'm often asked that uh, why don't I, uh, why, do, why do so many, so few people realize God? If God realization is the aim of life, if it's such a wonderful thing, why do so few people realize God? The answer is simple, how many want God really? When we read, read all this, when we listen to lectures and think about it, we think it's a good thing, so I should realize God. But do I really want it? 
intensely, more than anything else. You might say, is it possible to want like that? Yes. We want so many things in the world like that, one after another, none of which fulfills our, our thirst. And yet, <laughs> this is Maya, that we do not really want it, even if we are suffering in the, in the world. So Ramakrishna used to give the example of the camel, which eats thorny bushes, and its mouth bleeds, but it keeps on eating those bushes. So our life is like that, in the world. We keep eating the thorny bushes of the world, and we suffer. Uh, our thirst is not quenched, and yet we keep on repeating that. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. You will find peace if you cry for God. One of the great Vaishnava teachers, he says, in Vaishnavism, the love of God, one of the moods is viraha. Viraha means when the lover is separated from the beloved, so you hanker for the presence of the beloved. Uh, you miss the beloved very terribly. So that's called viraha. So the gopis missed Krishna. That viraha itself is a spiritual practice, great spiritual practice. One of the Vaishnava teachers says, the tears which one sheds in viraha, missing God, the ha the, that has more happiness than all the pleasures of the world. When you get all the pleasures of the world and smile, how happy I am, what a great time I am having, the person who is crying for God is actually happier than you. That gives more, the tears shed for God give more happiness than all the smiles in the world. So, blessed are they who mourn. Mourn means not for worldly things, for, you know, for God. And they shall be comforted. But they will find peace. How did Sri Ramakrishna find God? How did Sri Ramakrishna find God? What was the sadhana? What was the great spiritual technique? What meditation? What ritual? What great books did he read? Anchoring. What was the path he followed? He cried for God. He followed all the paths. They came much later. But first, the first breakthrough he made was simply he cried for God. He wept. And he got God realization. All the rest came later. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Doesn't seem to be so. <laughs> it doesn't seem to be so. It seems to be just the opposite. People say, Swami, don't say these things. This is New York. This is America. You Blessed are the aggressive. <laughs> Blessed are they, they who will sell themselves. So you have to promote yourself. Otherwise, if you are quiet and meek, you will lose the, the race. And the race, but that reminds me of the saying, you know, even if you win the rat race, you are still a rat. <laughs> <laughs> Blessed are the meek. For they, they shall, look at the promise. They shall inherit the earth. Often, the advice given in spiritual books seems to be quite contrary to the advice that uh, we give, we, we find in this world. You know, motivational speakers, they'll come and pump you up, especially here uh, in the United States. Full, full of enthusiasm, ambition, uh, worldly achievement. The, in the Imitation of Christ, there's a book very close to Swami Vivekananda's heart. Uh, there is a it is written in the medieval times by a monk, Thomas Akempis. So there he imagines a dialogue between the um, devout person and as if Jesus Christ is speaking to the devout person. How do I get peace? And he imagines that Jesus is telling you how to get peace. Now the advice which is given there is exactly the 180 degrees opposite of what we teach in the world today, what is taught to children today. You know what is the advice? Jesus says, My son, my child, if you want peace, then do these four things. One is, always seek to have, you will, I don't know if people will walk out if you hear this. Always seek to have less rather than more. Just the opposite of modern culture. Always seek to, your ambition should be to have less and less and less, not more and more and more. People will be uh, annoyed if I say these things. Always seek to have less rather than more. I, and this is the beginning. It gets worse and worse and worse. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
Second, second, always seek to be last rather than first. In India, especially people, parents say, Swami, what are you saying? We, we, have, we uh, uh, continuously tell our children, always try to be first in everything. Always seek to be last rather than first. Remember the condition for uh, peace. No wonder people don't have peace. <laughs> We're doing just the opposite. Always seek to have less rather than more. In the, one thing that surprised me in America when I came here was, I would see these big buildings, Uncle Bob storage, which means you have stuff which keeps on increasing in your house. Then it out pours out of your house into your garage. Then there's no space left for the car also in the garage. Then you, you, and still you can't give it up. So you pack it all up and then you take it to self storage where you may not see it ever. Even your grandchildren may not ever see it. <laughs> Only Uncle Bob will get, keep getting the rent. <laughs> stuff overflowing. Just the opposite. Always seek to have less rather than more. Always seek to uh, be last rather than first in matters of enjoyment, in worldly. Let others have the credit. I always say it's, it's like a mother. You have baked a pie and the kids are coming home from school. The last piece is left. Would you want to enjoy that? Let, the kids are coming. Let me finish it up before they come. <laughs> no. Your joy is in giving it to the children. You're waiting for the children to come and eat it. So let me be last. Let others enjoy. You will get peace. Then the third one, even more difficult. Always seek to do the will of another rather than your own will. What the other person wants. What the husband wants, let it be done. What the wife wants, let it be done. Often you see the quarrel which we have. It's mostly matters of opinion. Little better, little worse. You might say, no, no, I know better. This is better. He doesn't know or she doesn't know. No understanding. Better maybe, yes, you may be right. It may be a little better. Yeah. That what the other person wants may be a little worse. It's usually not terribly different. Let the will of another be done rather than my own will. But we know, I, you, uh, once in a while at least listen to me. <laughs> that, that, that's the beginning of the quarrel. <laughs> no, let the will of another be done. Huh. Then the last one is very beautiful, the fourth one. And in all things, try to know and accept the will of God. Whatever happens in life, it is definitely, if you have any belief in God, it must be by the will of God. Mentally accept it. Not that if, you, if I have got an illness, I will not go for treatment. If there is a problem in the house, I will not solve it. Of course I will solve it. Of course I will go for treatment. But mentally inside you accept it. That this is the will of God. Don't be agitated, restless, bitter inside. Whatever happens, it's the will of God. So these four things, I will repeat, if you want peace. Always seek to have yes. more, less. less. Oh, you're good. <laughs> less rather than more. Always seek seek to be last yes. rather than first. Always seek to do the will of another rather than your own will. And in all things, learn to see and accept the will of God. If you want peace, the first thing is if you want peace. Condition is very simple. No, I don't like these conditions then you will not get peace. <laughs> and look at our lives. Look at our lives. No peace. Anyway, so blessed are the, are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And then he goes on to say, blessed are they who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they, sh uh, for they shall be, for they, for, for, for they shall be filled. Hunger and thirst of righteousness means not just the way it is ordinarily understood that I will develop good qualities, I will be truthful, uh, I will not tell lies, I will be uh, gentle, I will not be violent. These are good qualities, virtues, true. If you hunger for virtues, that's true, that's good. But the deeper meaning is this. Hunger and thirst after righteousness means those who hunger for God-realization, for spiritual realization. Not just for a good life, for a godly life. Sri Ramakrishna used to tell the story of a person 
um, who asked, when will I realize God? So his guru took him to a stream and they went there to take a bath. As they dipped themselves into the stream, the guru pushed the disciple's head under the water. After some time, the disciple started struggling. He couldn't breathe. And then finally the guru released him and came up gasping, how did you feel? The disciple said, just for one breath of air, I could have given anything. That was all I wanted, one breath of air. And the guru said, when you want God like that, you will realize God. Blessed are they that hunger and thirst after righteousness. Righteousness here is godliness. Then he says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy, they shall obtain mercy. Those who are angry and hateful and revengeful, even what you call righteous anger, righteous indignation, this is wrong, I'm angry. Even what you call, uh, there is, they say that, hate the sin, not the sinner. But even if you hate the sin, very difficult to separate the sin from the sinner. Very difficult to separate the sin from the sinner. And even if you, if one hates the sin, it's still hate in the heart. There is a saying that uh, among the yogis, the one who lights a fire, the place where you light a fire, that place gets burnt first, then it burns something else. So if you light the fire of anger, of hatred here, it will hurt others, but first it will hurt me. It is the foolish person who, ca who cannot get angry. It is the wise person who does not get angry. A person who cannot get angry, does not feel upset, a fool, tamasic. But the person who does not give way to anger, does not get angry, that is the white, wise person. Those who show mercy. And what a beautiful thing that they shall obtain mercy. If you show mercy, we have done so many wrong things. If you look at it from the point of view of karma also, the result of those things are going to, bound to come. But if I am merciful, if I for, forgive the wrongs of others, and then I will also be forgiven in turn. It's not exactly relevant. It reminds me of always seek to have less rather than more a story about one of the early desert fathers, two of them. You know, after the life of Christ, after Christ, when the early church came up, some of them, they took to intense tapasya. They went into the desert and lived there in prayer and contemplation. Like the sannyasis in India, begging for food and spending the time in meditation and prayer. So this possession, always seeking to have less rather than more. Two monks, the early desert fathers, they used to live in a little hut, very poor little hut. They had no possessions. And they used to spend their time in edifying spiritual conversation whenever they had time to speak to each other. And once one of them said to the other, Brother, today we shall see how quarrels start among worldly people. We must understand this. So how does it start? Well, I don't have any possessions, but here is this brick. I will say this brick is mine and you will say, no, the brick is mine. And in this way, when you keep on saying this, the quarrel will start between us. So let us see. Let us start. The other one said, fine. So one of them said, the brick is mine. The other said, yes, brother, it is yours. <laughs> no quarrel. <laughs> Revered Swami Bhuteshanji used to tell a joke how two businessmen are talking to each other. It's in India. I'll translate for you. They're saying to each other, how close, how friendly the two families are. They're saying, look, w um, I'll tell you in Hindi first and then translate. Are bhai, oh brother, tera maal, mera maal. Tera maal, mera maal. That means all your possessions are like my own possessions. Huh? All your positions are like your own positions. Or mera mal. <laughs> my positions. And then he starts chuckling. Well, well, well. <laughs> so your positions are like my positions. Your positions are like my own positions. We are so close to each other. And my positions? Ah. <laughs> he stops there. So, no, that is not brotherhood. They're selfishness. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. 
And then very powerful teaching. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. So direct. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Commenting on this, Swami Prabhavanandaji says, what does it mean, pure in heart? Simple experiment. He says, sit quietly and start thinking about God, any way you are accustomed to. Your devotee of Christ or Krishna or Rama, in whatever way, think of the Lord in your heart. Very soon, 10 seconds, 30 seconds, 1 minute, 2 minutes, other thoughts will start coming. And you will complain, my mind goes here and there, I can't concentrate on God. But why? Where are those other thoughts coming from? I have deliberately thought, I am going to do the greatest thing possible, I shall spend time thinking of God. Yet I cannot. My own mind betrays me. Why? Where are those thoughts coming from? They come from our, our samskaras. What we have done and seen and said in this life, and indeed many, many lives passed. There is a phrase, prachina karma samskara. So this whatever we have stuffed into our mind, which has sunk into this subconscious mind, that bubbles up in the form of desires, in the form of I like, I want, I don't like, I detest, I hate. Raga dvesha in Sanskrit, attraction and repulsion. That's what boils up from inside. And this is the impurity of the mind. And this is what diverts us away from God realization, from, from God. A pure mind will settle down on God and stay there. Somebody said, mind is not the enemy. Mind is not the enemy. A purified mind naturally runs to God. What a beautiful statement. God has given us the body and mind to realize Him. So a purified mind will automatically run. It's your best friend. In the Gita it is said, the mind is your greatest enemy and it is your best friend. How is it your greatest enemy? Uncontrolled mind. Greatest enemy. How is it your best friend? Controlled mind, best friend. Then how can we control? Why is it so difficult to control? Impurity of mind. So Jesus says, those who are pure in, uh, uh, blessed are the pure in heart. For they shall see God. I think it's Matthew in, in one of his, uh, in, in the Bible itself you find. Be ye renewed of mind. That's the language used. Be ye renewed of mind. What is renewed of mind? Chitta Shuddhi, purification of mind. This was understood. Sadhakas, spiritual seekers, practitioners, in any religion, they immediately run against this obstacle. And so it is understood in all religions. Inner purification is necessary if anybody wants to be spiritual at all. Powerful teachings. Look at the language. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. And Swami Brahmananda, Swami Prabhavanji gives an example of his own guru, Swami Brahmananda, who was in fact called the son of Sri Ramakrishna, spiritual son of Sri Ramakrishna. Once in Kashi in Banaras, the monks were quarreling among each other. They, and the senior monks did not know what to do. And Swami Brahmananda said, don't do anything, I am going there. He was the president of the order. He went there and you know what he did? Nothing. He just stayed there and he said, come and sit with me and meditate. And so all of them came, including the troublemakers. Very soon in a few days, everybody's mind was so elevated that they forgave each other and all became um, focused on God. And the, the ringleader of all the trouble, he became so inspired that he left the monastery and went off to the Himalayas to meditate and find God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called the children of God. Literally, Swami Brahmananda was called the spiritual child of Sri Ramakrishna. Blessed are ye if you are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. If people trouble you for spirituality, for, for religion, uh, actually one reason is that at that time in Europe and the Middle East it always has been so, there is religious conflict. Many people are persecuted for religion. That is not something that we understand so much in India. You are not persecuted. Very little was there. Sometimes there were quarrels between Vaishnavas and Shaivas, for example. Sometimes there were quarrels between Hindus and Buddhists in the early 2000 years ago or so. But not much. Almost nothing is there. So it's... Um, but in, in, for example, in the early history of Christianity, we find how they were persecuted for their beliefs in the Roman Empire. And stories are there. They were fed to the lions and those <laughs> terrible stories. They became the martyrs for their 
sake of religion. But it's not just that you have, you'll be fed to the lions if you come to Vedanta society. <laughs> but one thing is there. Anybody, whether in India or here or in ancient times or today, the moment you become seriously spiritual, an obstruction will be put in your way by the world. Because you are going against the current. It is a standing rebuke to those who are rushing into worldly life. If I rush into this world and think that this exactly is it, I must make a million dollars on Wall Street and I must party hard uh, on, on Broadway and that is the aim of life. Then I must also convince myself that these people who go to church or temple or mosque, or these people who meditate and uh, who pray, they must be wrong somehow. If they are not wrong, then I am wrong. So a kind of obstruction automatically comes. Anybody who becomes spirit, uh, interested in spiritual life, what from the maybe the family, maybe the friends, maybe the colleagues, maybe society in general, some obstruction comes. And that is good for your spiritual life. Swami Ashokanand in a speech he says in San Francisco in the 1950s, as you become interested in spiritual life, people object. They say, Oh, mom is not fun anymore. Since she has started becoming spiritual, she's so boring now. She doesn't want to go to parties. And Ashokanji says, good riddance, I say. <laughs> A time must come when must one becomes mature. One must rise above such things. So a little bit of obstruction there is good. Often the, the advice by well-meaning people will be, Oh, you're spiritual, you're meditating, you're praying, reading spiritual books. Not bad. But combine it with this. Little bit of worldliness, little bit of that. Ashokanji says, it's like saying, a little sip of nectar, little sip of poison, combine it. <laughs> why, should, why should you combine it? Blessed are ye if you are persecuted for the sake of uh, righteousness for God, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. Mm. Often the Christian monks would actually seek it out, where they would be persecuted, reviled and um, humiliated, because then it increases dependence on God and God alone, nothing else. Mm. I remember reading um, in a book of quotations that uh, if um, if the world is against truth, then Athanasius is against the world. I thought, who is this Athanasius? If the world is against truth, then I am against the world. Who can dare to say such a thing? So I looked it up in the early history of the, of the church. So he was, uh, he, he was a very senior member of the church, but he was exiled because of his views, particular views. So it was declared heretical and he was exiled a number of times from, I think, Rome and he used to live in Egypt. So he faced a lot of trouble in his life. He is the one who says, if the world is against truth, then I am against the world. In fact, a spiritual person is not somebody who tries to satisfy people in the world and gain popularity. Rather, a spiritual person would try to satisfy God and even if people in the world are upset with him or her. So. If people persecute you for the sake of righteousness, you should rejoice, for yours is the kingdom of heaven. So imagine the, these simple statements. He taught with these simple statements. Even 2000 years later, we remember the very language of the statement, the way it is phrased. In translation, we are reading it. He would tell stories. Jesus would teach through parables, simple stories, which have become part of literature all over the world now. All in the sphere of one, one year, just in one year. So, today, on the occasion of Easter, I pray to the Lord to bless all of us, to shower blessings, spiritual blessings on all gathered here. May our hearts bloom with devotion to God. May we find peace and joy in divinity, in God. Even a drop of this spiritual blessing, spiritual joy is greater than more profound than all the achievements, all the pleasures of the world. With this prayer, I conclude here. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Rupanam Astum